Okay, greetings, Sith and Jedi. My name's Danny Whitaker. As always, this is my own worst enemy, Mental Health Podcast. Is it Sith and Jedi, or Siths and Jedis? I don't actually, I don't actually know anything about Star Wars. I've tried watching it a few times, uh, but I can't, I can't seem to get through the first 20 minutes of any of them. It's like watching paint dry. In fact, it's worse than that. It's like watching paint that's already dried and not even coloured paint, just white paint. Dry, white paint. But then again, before you go getting offended, and all this can be a very sensitive subject for some people, uh, I enjoyed Batman vs Superman. Like, really enjoyed it. So, you know, what do I know? Not only that, but I can also say with zero irony, genuinely... I think Ben Affleck is hands down the greatest Batman of all time. So, you know, one man's meat and all that. I've just realised in trying to placate the Star Wars fans, I've probably just gone and offended a lot of Batman fans now, but never mind. I look forward to the emails. <laughs> Danny at myownworstenemy.org, if you feel so inclined. Anyway, today is Friday, 12th of May. Uh, which puts us at the tail end of Mental Health Awareness Week in the UK. I think it's Mental Health Awareness Month in the US. You guys have still got like two weeks to go. Uh, but, you know, bigger country, more people, so makes sense, I suppose. Uh, so, with that in mind, I've uh, got the perfect episode for you today. Today, we're discussing stigma. My guest today is Professor Graham Thornicroft. Graham is Professor of Community Psychiatry at King's College London and Consultant Psychiatrist for South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust. He's also the Chair of Maudsley International. Uh, Graham has authored or edited over 460 peer-reviewed papers and 30 books, including the Oxford Textbook of Community Mental Health and the book which kind of forms the basis for today's discussion, shunned discrimination against people with mental illness. In today's episode, we discuss the origins of stigma, from the etymology of the word itself to uh, historical depictions of mental asylums. Uh, we draw lines of distinction between concepts such as ignorance, prejudice and discrimination, and how each of these manifests in the real world. We explore how the media depicts mental illness, how stigma is actually measured and quantified by researchers, the importance of anti-stigma campaigns such as Time to Change and the ways in which they've proved successful. Uh, we touch on the recent trend in anti-stigma campaigns aimed specifically towards men. We ask if discrimination is ever justified and, most importantly, Graham gives a few tips on how people with mental health issues can navigate the potential minefield of disclosure. You can follow Graham on Twitter. He's at Thornicroft G. That's at Thornicroft G, and that's Thornicroft with an I, not a Y. I'm sure you'd like me to mention also the Time to Change campaign. Again, That's uh, so those guys are on Twitter. They're at Time to Change, uh, and the website is time-to-change.org.uk. As always, if you'd like to comment on this episode, you can do so by going to myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, there are various ways you can go about doing that. Again, just visit myownworstenemy.org forward slash support. And with all that said, I think what I'm going to do now is go make sure my antivirus software on my computer is up to date, just in case any uh, Star Wars or Batman fans decide to try and hack my computer and empty my bank account. Oh, good luck with that. There's only about 30 quid in there. I think that's spoken for. Anyway... As I always say, please enjoy my conversation with Professor Graham Thornacroft. Okay, Graham Thornacroft, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Danny. Um, here today to speak about a very important topic, one that seems to be part of the kind of the zeitgeist at the moment, uh, particularly in in media, and that's uh, stigma uh, with regards to mental health. But before we kind of jump into it, I always like to uh, find out a little bit about the person I'm talking to and um, and obviously why it is I'm, I'm talking to you specifically on this particular topic. So if you could just kind of give us a, a brief history of yourself, um, kind of your academic career and, and why you specialise in, in this particular subject. 
Okay, Danny. Well, um, I'm located in South London. I'm sitting here on a cold, wet, damp, dry, rainy <laughs> spring morning yeah. in South London. Yeah. And my, if you like, my official title is Professor of Community Psychiatry. Well, what does that mean? What do I actually do? And I do two things. One is I treat patients. I'm a doctor, a psychiatrist, and I work in what's called an early intervention team. That means that we take people in the first episode of having psychotic type problems and then we treat them for a couple of years to see um, what's the very best we can do to help people to recover as quickly as possible. But also a lot of the time I do research and I do research about three things. One is about stigma and discrimination. Two is about what's called global mental health. That's especially mental health issues in low and in middle income countries. And the third thing is about community based services and how to make them better, how to assess if they work. So one of the big things I'm interested in is about stigma and why. Well, I mean, I think throughout my professional life, I've had for a long time a sort of niggling feeling on the back of my mind that it's different from working with people who've got, for example, diabetes or high blood pressure. There's something different about the mental health field. And that got to the point about 10 years ago where I said, I want to look into this in more detail. So I was very lucky because I managed to get a year to stop all my usual work and just to do one thing. I said, I want to write a book about stigma. I want to look into this in a lot of detail. And so I read everything I could about stigma, not just in mental health, but in other areas, people with facial disfigurement, short stature, sex workers, all sorts of things. And then I tried to make sense of it. And in fact, when I read about stigma, I got both very uh, confused because the, the word means lots of things, but also got very frustrated and angry because it hadn't really led us to understand what to do to get rid of stigma. So I came to a different way of thinking about it. And it seems to me stigma is a general sort of overarching sort of umbrella word. Uh, but in fact, there are three different components which are important. The first is to do with knowledge about mental health or about mental illness. And mostly that refers to either ignorance, because most people don't know much about mental health, but also disinformation or misinformation, because a lot of the pe things that people think they know about mental illness are actually wrong, myths about violence and so on. The second thing is to do with feelings about how we react emotionally to people with mental health problems, either if it's that's ourselves or if somebody else. And most of the information we have is that's largely a negative set of emotional reactions. And so that's about people's attitudes. And essentially, I call that whole set of issues prejudice. And the third thing is to do with um, people's behaviours, their actions. So if you apply for a job and if you say something about having now or previously experience of a mental illness, does that make your chance of getting a job worse? And usually it does. So that whole area about people's behaviour I call discrimination. And in fact, as I read and thought more about these issues, uh, the book wasn't eventually about stigma. Uh, the book was about discrimination. It's called Shunned. And an example of that is that um, when I was little, I was three or four, my mother had a severe period of depression and in fact needed ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, before she got better. The tablets didn't, didn't help her for some reason. And when she went back to work, she was working as a local a district nurse. Uh, she didn't tell her boss why she'd been off sick. When I asked her more recently about that, she said, you know, it got to be mad. If I told my boss why I was off sick, then I wouldn't have been allowed to go back to work. So those are sort of behavioural issues which I think are important, issues to do with citizenship, to do with social inclusion towards getting to work, keeping work. So for all these reasons, uh, I think that stigma and discrimination is a very important area to focus on, not just theoretically, but very practically about how we can reduce them. Right, Graeme, before we kind of uh, get into the thick of it, um, I just wonder if you could kind of give us some um, statistics which kind of maybe paint a, a, a broad picture of the of the situation we're in at the moment with regards stigma, kind of where we're at, how bad it is, broad facts and figures, those kinds of things. So let's start with a few uh, basic sort of big picture bullet points. Um, and we'll begin with some work we did a few years ago when we talked to several hundred, in fact, about 700 people across the world uh, who'd been given a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And we asked them about their experience of stigma and discrimination. These are in all parts of the world. And about 90 percent said that they had experienced discrimination in their everyday lives. Most often 
that was either in the family or with friends or in the workplace, but also other aspects like transport or sometimes financial services or in religious facilities. We then went on in another study a few years later to ask the same question of people with depression, uh, this time in about 40 countries around the world. And now we're talking to over a thousand people who had a diagnosis of depression. And over 80 percent said that they had also uh, had experienced discrimination because of their mental health condition. And we also then said, and you know, does this stop you doing something? And surprisingly, a lot of people said that they had decided not to try to do things that were important, maybe like apply for a job because they expected to fail. So we call that in the sort of research jargon, we called it anticipated discrimination. Um, it's probably better described as why try syndrome, because if you expect to fail in getting the job, then maybe you shouldn't even waste time trying at all. So we think that these issues to stigma and discrimination are common in all parts of the world where we've looked. And often they all have severe consequences, which exclude people from everyday life. Yeah, when I was doing the, 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 the research for this interview, one of the things I found interesting was the, the kind of the etymology of the word stigma. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it dates back to people being uh, uh, branded for like committing crim criminal acts, I think in, in like the 16th and, and 17th century. Uh, am, I, am I right in thinking that that's the, the, the root of that word? And so it, the, the word is from originally from Greek. And it both applies to branding or sort of, you know, putting a mark on somebody's skin with a hot iron, but also to other, I mean, you know, stigmata of Christ and so on, other marks which distinguish a person. It's, it's a mark which then has a negative um, value attached to it. Right. So if somebody seems to be worse or worthless or belittled by virtue of that mark. Now, a lot of the most influential work in this field was 50 years ago by a, an American social scientist called Irving Goffman. And he wrote a book called Stigma. And one of the things he said is that you have to distinguish between so-called visible and invisible stigma. And in fact, he put people with mental health problems into the invisible stigma category, not like having leprosy, for example. And he said, and that means that, you know, potentially people uh, won't be recognized um, because it's not like you're know, not having a leg or so on. But of course, it's not as simple as that, because quite a lot of people with mental health issues do fear that they look different or maybe on tablets or medications which may cause side effects and they'd fear that those be recognized as indicating have a mental illness. So it's not as simple as either visible or invisible. But you're right that this word goes back a long time, at least you know, two and a half thousand years. And it's a mark that conveys a lesser value for a person. Yeah. The, 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 the reason I brought, brought that up specifically is it'd be, be quite easy for us to kind of jump straight into uh, uh, like contemporary issues to do with stigma but of course there's, there's, there's a history of it i mean I, I suppose i interviewed a guy called greg agigian a couple of weeks back on the topic of the, the history of mental illness and um obviously hi historically there's a very uh, there's been the maltreatment and uh, a kind of misrepresentation of people with mental illness dating you know back hundreds of years um but also it sounds like a very primitive question, but it's this idea of there being no smoke without fire. You know, that, that stigma um, possibly exists for a reason. And so I was just wondering if kind of from maybe a historical perspective, if you could maybe run us through the, I'm not sure if they are quite the right words, but the justified and the unjustified reasons for the historical existence of stigma. Well, um I mean, some people will say that the stigma is one way of seeing a sort of fundament, a fundamental human characteristic or attribute, which is between those like us and others. So in group and out group. And that this is somehow, you know, of uh, essential evolutionary importance. And it's very important that most people will know <clears throat> with whom they belong and who's from a different group and who's a threat. And so for quite a long time, people would say things like this, suggesting that it was so such a deep rooted concept that it might be very hard or indeed impossible to reduce stigma against people seen to be other otherly. Um, but in fact, that's wrong. So let's just think about some more recent evidence about whether stigma is sort of so rooted that it's unbudgeable. We know that until 
the Time to Change campaign started in England, which is 2008. It wasn't the case that stigma was just static and unchanging. Indeed, stigma in England was getting worse for the decade until Time to Change started, because the Department of Health in government, it runs annual public attitude surveys. And we can see this year by year getting worse. This is over the time when there were quite often you know, huge headlines and um, crazy killer and schizo and axe wielder, this type of thing. And also we've seen from many campaigns now in about a dozen countries that you can make stigma better if you really put your mind to it. So stigma isn't fixed. And going back more historically, as you mentioned, Danny, I think it's also um, in life, it'd be nice if life was nice and simple, but it's not. So why one can say is that the depictions of mental illness going back centuries, indeed millennia, are largely of negative images and portrayals of people with mental illness. That's not uniformly true. And in some places and some times, people whom today we might say have, for example, psychotic experiences, might have been seen as gifted or spiritual or visionaries and would then be given positive social status. So it's one can't easily generalise about these things. I wonder if it's something to do with just um, just that sense of, of of intrigue from people that it's you know the the, the imagery of say you know Victorian asylums and the like it's more kind of it's more intriguing it's it's more interesting it's more entertaining I guess almost for people and so it's maybe that's why those images are the ones that have been kind of brought to the forefront that, and, that, and that are kind of remembered more deeply because of course it's you know it's it's that that kind of history sort of I think it kind of lays the foundations and it, it, I think the stigma of today that those historical depictions they have to bear some of the responsibility for that. So I think there's quite a lot of what you're saying Danny that uh, I mean drama and you know threat um, seem more interesting and visually portrayed than a sort of you know, placid person sitting <laughs> doing nothing much of interest. Mm. And, you know, the not just historically, if you go back to you know, famous pictures of Paris madhouses in the 18th century, Salpetria, and, you know, people were typically raging and foaming and frothing and, you know, in straight jackets and so on. So that was a common way of portraying, you know, any mental illness. Interestingly, at the moment, another sort of fashion is that you'll see people, usually silhouettes, people in a dark corner, you know, head in, hands, clutching mm, the yeah. So that's a current sort of fashion for how to visually show something that's actually quite difficult to get a real picture in your mind about. But I think um, it's not as if these are just historical things. So we've done work with the police to see whether it's possible to reduce stigma among police officers. And the answer is yes. And it's the same way you reduce stigma with anybody else, is you arrange an occasion for people to have contact, personal, indirect contact between somebody you'd like to reduce the stigma for and people who experience a mental illness. And in this case, what the police officer said was quite interesting. They said, we only ever see people who are mentally ill and in a crisis or an extreme condition. Normally, we're asked to go to a public place to pick up somebody acting in a bizarre fashion and to take them or convey them to a place of safety. And then they said what was really interesting today when we had these two service users talking to us is they seemed normal. You know, they acted normally. We've never seen people who have said, yes, I have experienced mental illness, who've also been acting normally. So their raging a sort of stereotype is also common in some groups in our society today. What about for, you see, these kind of depictions of people, like you say, going crazy, having to be restrained, etc. Those are very, it's very obvious why those images stigmatizing what about things that uh, might be considered kind of less severe mental health issues like um, depression anxiety what are some mm. what are the ways that you think those are, are commonly misconceived and, and 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 therefore stigmatized well this is where it gets interesting you see if we start with the general portrayals and come on in a second to the violence question um there are very few um images which the media use in a systematic and repeated way to convey anxiety. And it's almost as if they just don't know how to deal with it because it's such an internal state. And unless somebody's you know, pouring with sweat or actually trembling visibly, it's very difficult to get a sort of handle on what it looks like. Passion, they've got more, they've got sort of more useful stereotypes. There's the sort of person in the corner, head and hands. There's the tearful person. There's somebody perhaps, you know, contemplating uh, an act of self-harm. But 
they struggle. If you think about I mean, common conditions like phobias, panic attacks, generalized anxiety, specific anxiety, it's interesting is don't sort of fit into the normal sort of um, uh, lexicon of media imagery. Now, if you come on to the question about violence, I mean, some people say, you know, although it may be exaggerated, there is, if you like, a real basis for stigma because, you know, some people with mental illness are more violent than others. And the closer you look into that question, um, the less clear it becomes. Indeed, I looked into that when I wrote this book I mentioned called Shunned. So for the, the, the large majority of types of mental illness, if we take depression or anxiety or panic attack or phobia or eating disorders or dementia, there's actually no evidence that people who have those experiences are any more likely to be violent than anybody else. Typically, uh, the focus of these discussions about violence comes to people with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Yeah. But when you look more closely there, first of all, this is very common. Sorry, uncommon. It's about you know, one in every 200 people and other conditions are actually much more common. But when you look into the evidence, again, it sort of disappears between your fingers. And the hardest evidence, if somebody has a diagnosis of schizophrenia and a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, so-called psychopath, and they're using alcohol or drugs or both, then there is a clearly increased risk that people in those three categories together are more violent than the average person. But the numbers in that group are tiny, and one shouldn't then apply that to the whole of the people with, for example, experience of psychosis, because it doesn't apply. Yeah, I think with, uh, especially with schizophrenia, that's, it's a common trope in uh, like TV series and movies that somebody going around killing people has got schizophrenia. Um, how, like we we're just saying about it, like the the kind of the responsibility that has to be borne by historical depictions. How much? I know it's difficult to kind of quantify, but how much of the responsibility needs to be borne by the media for mental health stigma in general, and you know, with newspapers, movies, etc. Well. Um... When, again, sorry just to keep going back, this is not an advertisement of my book, but <laughs> the book's all about stigma. When I was writing that, I wanted to be as sure as I could be that what I always said was fair. And indeed, I wrote a whole chapter about how the media uh, relays or conveys or amplifies images and stereotypes of mental illness. And then before I finished the book, I'd drafted that chapter and I sent it to two journalists I knew to say, is this, is this a reasonably fair account of mental illness in the media? And it's interesting. One came back saying, well, you've got a year to write a book, you know, you lucky fellow. But we have to write the equivalent amount in a newspaper every day. So we simply don't have time to check our facts. We just, you know, we just come out with what we think of, what's our, our usual way of dealing with the topic. So don't criticize, just back off. You know, this is we're doing our best. The other one said, which I also thought was quite interesting. He said, you know, the media is not fixated with mental illness, but it is fixated with violence because people will pay good money you know, to read stories about violence. And it is a, it is a public interest. In, and so if there's any connection between anything and violence, then that will come into the pot of what newspapers write about. And they say, well, we do think there's a connection with mental illness. Quite often in the courts, people are found to have you know, committed offences and also be having mental health problems at the time. So that's why newspapers pay attention to mental health. But still, that's really self-serving. So if you look, so if we think about the Time to Change campaign, a big cam campaign going on now for nine years, funded initially by Comic Relief and Big Lottery, but more recently, mostly by the government. And the team I work with here at King's College London has been evaluating the impact of that. And the good news is that we're finding slowly but steadily stigmas reducing across England in many ways. One way we've assessed this is to take press cuttings from six different newspapers across England every year. Three are national newspapers, three are local newspapers, and we sort of go through page by page. We identify any stories, any features, anything to do with mental, psychiatric, you name it, and then we look into the nature of the content. And what we've seen over eight, nine years now is that gradually the percentage of all those stories which are stigmatized have been coming down, and gradually, the percentage of the stories which are anti-stigmatizing have been going up. And indeed, last year, we found for the first time that there were more anti-stigmatizing than stigmatizing stories. And that sort of, that chimes with my own 
the individual impression is that quite rarely these days you see the front page tabloid headline screaming psycho killer and that you know, the incidents still do occur. And some people who commit offences, you know, have mental health problems. Um, of course they do. But um, but quite often it's buried on you know, page four, or page five. It's a modest piece. Quite often it's fairly responsible. And it's not written anything like the sensationalised way that we had seen 10 years ago. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. Partly it's the time change campaign. I think another thing that's been helping a lot are the Mind Media Awards. So each year the Mind charity runs a big sort of glitzy media evening. Prizes are given out for you know best student journalist, best um, sitcom, um, best documentary and so on. And a lot of people in the media come to that and see people being rewarded for covering mental health in a responsible way. And indeed, at the most recent event, a couple of months ago, it was very moving because Freddie Flintoff, the cricketer, was hosting it. Um, somebody who received a prize said this is very important for her because she'd had a friend who'd lost her husband to suicide. And then Freddie Flintoff said, well, I've lost two mates in the last year to suicide as well. So you see that this affects everybody, you know, well known or not well known. And I think the media getting rewards and recognition for responsible coverage is also a very powerful effect to help media coverage improve over time. Um, one kind of, one, yeah, one last question I've got before we move on to um, kind of how you guys actually study this stuff is, um, are you familiar with the work of uh, Mark Schaller and this concept of the behavioural immune system? No, I don't know that, I'm afraid. Right, okay. So uh, very briefly, uh, he can, he proposed this theory that because we can detect explicitly whether or not people we come into contact with might be infected with a particular virus or bacteria, that we have this, uh, like a, a batch of psychological mechanisms kind of uh, using our senses to take certain cues from the environment and, and, and from the person themselves as a, as a way to assess whether or not they might pose some sort of contamination risk. Uh, and that if we do pick up on something, it results in a sort of disgust mechanism that that makes us want to avoid the person. Uh, apparently, it's been shown that this this mechanism contributes towards uh, prejudice against people who are overweight, people with disabilities, uh, and elderly people as well. I think. So, I'm just wondering if this maybe extends to people with mental health issues as well. That if if we know or hear that that person over there is mentally ill, quote unquote, that maybe we then fear, uh, like consciously or unconsciously, that we might catch it. Uh, so I guess that was a very long-winded way of asking if some stigma can be explained by a kind of a fear of contamination, maybe. Yeah, okay, yes. So, you know... Is there, is there a popular fear of contamination? So let's start with um, the many different types of community in just living in England at the moment, for example. So I think there are a number of, if you like, popular, I'd call them myths or misunderstandings, uh, which are commonly found. I'll give you an example. One is that you don't talk to a depressed person because that brings you down, that makes you depressed. So there's a sort of emotional contamination. So it's not to do with bugs jumping around. It's just that that sort of, you know, the bad moods sort of seeps across like a sort of horrible tree color. Maybe it envelops you and you, you're brought down and you can't stop it somehow. Now, of course, that's that's nonsense. And we know that the best thing you can do is to offer support and to offer to talk, to try to engage and have a, you know, a good chat about things. Um, but the myth itself is directly counterproductive because it's stopping people from wanting to talk, not just because they think they won't help the other person, because they think it might actually make themselves worse. The, the, the related thing to that, which I think is also extremely unhelpful, is the idea that you don't want to talk to a person who might be suicidal because you might trigger it off, and then you would be responsible or held responsible for that person's death. And of course, the opposite is the case. Very commonly, what people need is someone to talk to, to show concern, to offer support, maybe to be a link 
with getting other help or professional help. So that myth of you don't talk to somebody in case you trigger it actually is the last thing that you should be doing. So I think there are some of these ideas. But I think if we take other communities and look at so religious communities, there will be people in many types of religious and faith community who would see an important spiritual component to mental health issues. Indeed, they might think that mental health problems come about from a lack of prayer or the wrong prayer or insufficient prayer or by the influence of a spirit or in the Muslim world by a jinn. So I think there are a lot of, a lot of, um, if you like, explanatory ideas around and you can't ignore them. And for many people, they're very important. We have to try to understand those and at the same time say support and talk and sometimes treatment maybe psychological, maybe medication, maybe some other types of treatment are available and are effective and can go in parallel with support from faith communities as well. Okay, I'd, I, I'd like to move on now to kind of how you, um, I, can, I, I can imagine the listeners now are, are wanting to know, like to get into the thick of how it actually affects people. And I'm going to get onto that, but I really want to kind of lay the, the, the groundwork before we get there. Uh, I'm interested now in, how you guys actually study this and you kind of you kind of mentioned one briefly about taking um like newspaper cuttings to kind of measure um the the media depictions but what are some other ways that you you you, you study stigmatization so let's um uh, let me give you a specific example danny which is the way we've tried to assess if this national campaign in england called time to change is actually working okay so the starting point is the thing I mentioned a little while ago about splitting up stigma as a big thing into three specific areas, namely knowledge and attitudes and behavior. So quite often then in the studies we do about stigma, we're measuring knowledge and we're measuring attitude separately and we're measuring behavior separately. Right. Now it seems to me that the most important is the behavioral area, which is the discrimination. So although I think it's important to know in what to the general public thinking, What's more important for many people is, you know, will I actually get that job? So I think we give most emphasis to the reports of service users about whether their lives and their experiences are getting better or not. So because of that, um, we had to develop uh, some new scales, this new ways to find out about these things. And we developed a, a thing called DISC, which is Discrimination and Stigma Scale. And the way that works is that the, the person... Um, undertaking the interview, sits down with a person with experience of mental illness and asks for their views and then records their views directly. So it's a service user um, sourced set of information. It says things like, have you been treated unfairly, um, you know, in your workplace and applying for a job? Have you been treated unfairly and going to see a GP or people in primary care? Have you been treated unfairly in any aspect of housing? And then you get a profile about um, how common these difficulties are, how severe they are. And then what we've done each year is to phone up a thousand people across England, people who are in contact with mental health services, and go through these questions. And then we can see over time whether the reports of service users indicate that stigma and discrimination are getting worse or better. And to our surprise, for example, in the first four years of Time to Change, we found that people reported 11% less discrimination than they did at the start of the campaign. Now, it'd be nice if everything's getting better and it's a very simple and clear picture. But again, life's more complicated. And we saw, for example, when the disability living allowance changes came in, that a lot of people with mental health problems had a great difficulty in um, connecting the old benefits with the new ones. Some people were disallowed, had to appeal, maybe appeal several times. And that caused them a great deal of difficulty and stress, which they reported as discriminatory in relation to welfare benefits. But overall, the picture has been discrimination improving over that period. So we measure knowledge and we measure attitudes and discrimination, but it's service use reports of discrimination that we see as the most important part of the whole evaluation. Do you have to take into consideration, I suppose, um, you know, when, you, when you're asking people whether they've been discriminated against, there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of what they perceive as opposed to maybe what's actually taking place, I suppose the best way to articulate this is that, you know, even if even if people are prejudiced, prejudice doesn't always necessarily translate into discrimination. And um, 
So say when, when you're asking people that are uh, people with mental health issues, if they've experienced discrimination, there's a level of interpretation to be had there um, that they may be wrong about. They may not have been discriminated against. It might just have been their perception of the situation. So d do you do any, any studies which involve people that are maybe engaging in discrimination and then asking them why they do so? And is that possible or I don't know if I've articulated that well enough. Okay. So um, th this is a fascinating question, Danny. We, when we started doing this work to assess discrimination, um, we were debating these issues and we came to the point of saying, well, you know, who can say what's real discrimination or who's not? Except that what's the strongest type of statement is the experience of those people at the receiving end of discrimination about what's happening. So we gave primary attention to that. Now, some people said, well, you know, if somebody's paranoid, they'll feel they're being, you know, not treated fairly. So that wouldn't be a fair assessment if that person said, yes, I'm being discriminated all day long. So when we developed this so-called DISC, the discrimination scale, we added a couple of questions at the end to the interviewer and said, for these 30 odd questions, for how many, if any, do you think that the answer might be influenced at all by the person's mental condition or their mental state? Right. We found that the average has been between zero and one of those 30 questions. Okay. So we didn't think that that was a major influence. In fact, we thought that was far outweighed by paying respect and paying a lot of attention to the direct views of people with experience of mental illness. Because quite often they're not. There's an expert saying something about, you know, what's real discrimination. So we, we give that as the primary source of information. But but there is there's another aspect that's actually quite important. Because for, for a person to say, you know, I have been discriminated against suggests that they have either experience or they can imagine a world in which there's no discrimination or there's less. Or uh, they can imagine that they should be treated more fairly. And that is a gap when they think that what's happened to them is wrong and they'd like to state that and they should be treated better. But there are some situations where trying to know about a, a better and a fairer way of being treated is actually very difficult. So I'll give you an example. I was um, training some colleagues in a, a, an Eastern European country who were assessing discrimination and um, the scale, this assessment didn't seem to be working very well. And so I went to discuss this, and it turns out that, especially among people who've been in a psychiatric hospital for many years, um, many of those people couldn't imagine any other way of living. So when they're asked, you know, are you being treated fairly a lot, you know, how, with what could they compare their current situation, and they couldn't imagine any other life. So they simply didn't know if their treatment was fair or unfair, because that would have been their life for many years, and that's what they expected every day. So I think it does presume that people have a sense of what's either right or fair or shows justice. And some of the demeaning, sometimes dehumanizing ways in which people with mental illness are especially kept in long term institutions may actually make that sense of a, a fair life very difficult for some people. And and what about from, from the other side, the people kind of doling out the discrimination, for want of a better term? Is there any way of you know, conversing with those people and, and, and finding out the, the the nature of the prejudice and where it comes from. See, I don't, I mean, to, to some extent, this is a, it's not the same, but it's similar to racism. And I mean, the, the entire effort or the large part of the effort in the last few decades in Britain has been to stop the public manifestation of racism so that it's, it, it's unlawful to make racist comments or, or actions. Now, but you can't actually stop people thinking things. No. So what they might know or they might their, atti their knowledge or their attitudes might be racist. But to some extent, that doesn't matter if they're not acting or behaving in a racist way. Now, clearly, you want no knowledge and no attitudes and no behavior that's racist. But the important thing in terms of what the law and also what the state can do is to stop the behavior. And similarly, if we think about the mental health sector, is that, um, you know, a lot of people might be fearful or anxious, or you know, show disgust, whatever. But if they're still treated, but they're for an employer and they're giving an applicant a fair hearing and applying for a job, then 
um, that that's that's less important. But let's come on to a, a practical way. So under the Equality Act, it's now unlawful, at least in Britain, to inquire about a health problem. And this means physical or mental health problem, either at the job application stage or at the job interview stage. So you should be treated fairly because that information doesn't come into play. Now, if somebody does have a health condition, quite often they'll be at the next stage if they're off the job, where that might be picked up at the occupational health check or even the occupational health assessment. But it means that the law has sought to outlaw discrimination on health grounds. So I think that's a step forward. Now, there's, you know, it's not as simple as that, and that's not solved the problem, but there's a clear advance over somebody not being shortlisted at all. If there's a section on the form saying health problems, it says psychiatric treatment, and they're not shortlisted. So I think we've seen some some progress there. Right. So it's, I guess it's it's more important that you, as long as you're seeing those figures reducing of, of, of stigma overall, it's not necessary to try and dig so far down into the details. I mean, at least at least on the side of people that are committing discrimination. You see, I don't think that. Let's take a situation where a person with experience of mental ill health feels discriminated against, you know, in a one to one situation. I don't think it's common that the other person is sitting there deliberately thinking, you know, now I'll discriminate against the person. So I don't think it's malevolent. I think it's largely because they're not aware that what they're doing can cause offence. So somebody might say, oh, he's mental. Hmm. And not realise that another person you know, in in that situation who may have had mental illness could take offence, but it's not meant unkindly or harshly. So I think it's it's lack of knowing the implication of what people are saying, rather than uh, it deliberately being uh, a sort of intentional harmful act. Yeah, I think that's a quite an important thing to point out, actually, isn't it? Because I think um, stigma can often be misinterpreted as that as people just being nasty and just being malevolent when it's I'd, I guess, but I'd guess more often than not, it is just down to misinformation or no information. So let me give another example. So when we started the evaluation of this national anti-stigma campaign called Time to Change, there had been just around that time an interesting survey by something called the Shore Trust. And the Shore Trust is a charity that does work related to employment and employers. And they'd actually done a survey asking employers about people with mental illness in their organizations and if they had any policies or practices you know, to help. And to my amazement, this would be about 2007, 2008, they found that 30 or 40 percent of employers said, no, nope, we don't have any policies because we don't have anybody with mental illness in our organization. And so it's an astonishing degree of ignorance. So they weren't deliberately saying you know, we're discriminating against these people. They just said, no, nope, no, we don't have that problem. You know, next question. Now, interestingly, we did this as this follow up to that survey about three or four years later, by which time there'd been lots of uh, activity to support employers to recognize these these difficulties. And it dropped down to about 10 percent of employers then uh, said they didn't think people in their organization had mental health problems. And the number of people who had policies or procedures like so-called employee assistance programs had gone up a lot. So I think part of the question is simply. Um, making people aware about just how common mental illnesses are everywhere, whether you're in a in your school or a college or a workplace, and that the treatments are effective and that the treatments are widely available and that for many conditions there's a choice. And you can choose whether to have you know, psychological treatment or medication or some type of social intervention and that it's um, for the large majority of people on a sort of you know, going to an outpatient clinic or to community mental health centre and try and get away from the idea that, you know, any contact with a psychiatrist means you're going to be locked up and sort of have done things against your will. Now now that we're on it, kind of sticking with the the, the employment aspects of it. So, you know, I've, I've read a couple of the, 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 the studies that, that you've done and some of the, like, the effects, some of the, yeah, some of the effects that people experience as a result of stigma um, in the workplace. Uh, lower rates of hiring, lower pay, uh, more often sacked, and uh, poor promotional prospects. Um, my own personal experience, so when I was at the worst with my anxiety disorder, I had a driving job at the time, and I had to jump before I was pushed, basically. Because the fact of the matter was, as a result of that disorder, which I didn't have when I first started the job, I was an unproductive I was becoming an unproductive 
member of the team. I wasn't fulfilling my obligations in, in, in the role. I was becoming unreliable, um, very flaky. Um, and just from that perspective, is it, is it ever fair? Is discrimination ever fair on the, 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 the part of the employer? So the answer is yes. So first of all, what do I mean when I say discrimination? Well, I use it as a shorthand um, for what is more properly called negative discrimination. Now, when we started to look at this issue, when we started to measure it with this scale to assess discrimination, we initially said, have you been treated differently because of your mental illness you know, in seeking a job? And the scale went from yes, much worse to yes, much better. And then we said, well, we don't presume about whether discrimination will be in your advantage or you know, in, against you. And then we did this. We assessed people actually in this sort of early version of the scale in 27 different countries around the world. And we found very rarely, in fact, hardly ever did people describe any positive discrimination. And in fact, the only areas in which people did say that having mental illness had actually helped them was either got a bus pass or some sort of free travel card. Or sometimes if they got quicker access to housing, if they were sort of homeless and mentally ill. Right. And also to some extent, um, getting support from family members. But, but across the board, you know, 90 something percent of all the experiences of discrimination were negative ones. So we therefore we dropped all the advantages side of scale just to simplify. We just said, tell us if discrimination has been against you in these particular ways. Now, so that's. So when I talk about discrimination, I'm, use, I'm using it to, to say negative discrimination. But of course, discrimination simply means, you know, to differentiate A from B. And it doesn't necessarily have to be negative. And indeed, on some occasions, to come back to your question, Danny, it is reasonable and fair to discriminate against a particular type of situation or behavior. Now, this isn't reasonable and fair to discriminate against a person because of a diagnosis. But let's say somebody's on a drug which is moderately sedating and, you know, let's say that they've tried different tablets and this is the best balance between the positive effects and the negative effects. And then they apply for a job as a train driver and then perhaps they're given a performance test and a bit slow to react when the brake warning light comes on or something. In that situation, I think it would be fair to discriminate against that person saying that you are not fit for this particular role or task, not because of the diagnosis, but because of that person's task performance, their actual skills. So I don't think it's right discrimination by virtue of any label like depression or schizophrenia or whatever. But I do think it's right to say that some people with mental illness in some circumstances may not be uh, able to fulfill particular roles and therefore be refused those particular types of job. Yeah, it's, it, it seems a tricky one as well. It, is, it seems a bit of a paradox in the... Uh, in the way of informing people, because um, on the one hand, I think like with things like depression, people can think that people that, that are struggling with depression are just sort of malingering and they just need to buck up. So the message there needs to be that, no, this, you know, this really can be a really debilitating illness. But then on the other hand, you also, we also need people to, especially employers, to understand that people can have a diagnosis, but still function perfectly well in the workplace. And that seems like a bit of a tricky thing to weigh up in, 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 in the message, I think. Well, I think, um, so let's imagine that you or I were an employer. And if you think back to this survey we mentioned a moment ago by this charity called the Shore Trust, in fact, 10 years ago, it was very common for, to, for bosses to say, no, I'm not going to knowingly employ some of the mental illness because they're unreliable, they'll be off sick half the time. But it's the knowingly employ bit because, of course, you know, up to a quarter of all employees will have mental health problems in a year because everybody does because it's so common. And for them to think that they can sort of selectively not employ people with mental illness and therefore not have it as a problem in their workplace is wrong because, you know, everybody uh, can and uh, sooner or later quite a lot of us do develop mental health problems. So they can't just stick their head in the sand saying we won't take those people on and we'll just get on without it. And there is a huge cost, not just to the individual and their families, but to the work and to the workplace. If you either have a lot of people off sick without getting help or have people carrying on, uh, you know, still trying to do their work, so-called presenteeism, not absenteeism, but, you know, under par. But even going beyond that, 
Now, quite a lot of people who actually are not feeling very well mentally still going to work, masking and hiding it very successfully, um, perhaps going home in tears, but, you know, soldiering through the day without showing their feelings. And that doesn't add to that person's well-being. Maybe they're managing and working, you know, invisibly, but they may be even more productive if they had their difficulties addressed and helped. And they may even show more loyalty to the firm if they actually got help, you know, from the employer as well as outside. So that you find that um, there, there's not just a question, if you like, of an employer saying, well, I'll get rid of people who've got difficulties. There are huge costs with them um, if they were sacked, for example, in having to re-recruit, uh, retrain, get this experience of new people as well. And it's much simpler and quicker and more efficient, as well as more humane, for employers to actually look after the health of their employees and to help those who become unwell get through that and recover. Because it happens to, you know, to virtually all of us at some stage. Yeah, good, um, good little segue into an, another issue which um, you've raised as well is this di- on the part of the the employee, this dilemma of whether or not to disclose their mental health condition. I don't know if you can, if there's any way of answering this broadly. It seems like something that's better assessed by an individual on a case by case basis. But is there any? Is there any kind of broad advice that you could give to people about whether or not they should disclose their condition to an employer or to anybody for that matter? So let's first of all look at the extremes. Um, a situation where somebody is feeling extremely unwell mentally, uh, thinks that maybe their personal relationships, maybe the working situation, their friendships would be damaged if they said anything to anybody and that, you know, everybody else would talk and gossip would get around and therefore doesn't say a word. So the downside is they don't have direct, if you like, reputational damage, but nor will they get support, sympathy, empathy, maybe help to get to treatment. um, And they may actually continue to be unwell for quite some time. Um, And other people don't know if they're hiding successfully um, that help is needed. Now, let's take the other end of the spectrum to start with. Somebody who's very open, speaks with everybody, tells whoever is passing by, you know, I've got depression or whatever. And quite often they will get negative reactions from others because still stigma, let's say in England now, is very common and sometimes very strong. So first of all, one can't generalize. There's not an answer that would apply to anybody. Um, so let's take the example of a person applying for a job. So I wouldn't say it's a question about you know, do you disclose or not, but much more a question of, you know, if you want to disclose, then thinking about something that's called conditional disclosure. That would mean, well, would you say something and when and to whom and how much would you say and with what safeguards? So again, let me give an example. The patient I've been treating recently, um, a young woman with um, um, some psychotic symptoms, and she had a job and then was off sick from work for about two or three months. And then... um, said a little bit to the boss about some mental health issues. The boss reacted actually quite positively, but not too much detail. And then discussed with the boss in a bit more detail what had been happening. The boss said, fine, you'll have a graded return to work. And the the woman then said, but, you know, I don't want you to tell anybody else in the workplace. I will decide what I say. So she was managing different information, different people, sort of on a need to know basis. And then went back and in this office, you know, most people said, oh, you know, hello again. Uh, a few then said, where have you been? She said, I've had a career break to think about the future, which was actually true. Now, it wasn't a voluntary break because she'd become unwell, you know, not of her choosing. But she had had a career break. Uh, she had been thinking about the future. And so it wasn't a lie. But she didn't say anything about mental anything. And then the couple who had actually inquired about why she'd been off, said, oh, all right, good to see you back. And that was it. So, in fact, there wasn't, you know, any great probing or need to know. She made a true statement, but a, you know, a bit of the truth. And then she got back to work and carried on and gradually went from two, three, four days a week and so on. So I think one approach that may be helpful to some people, again, I'm not generalizing, is to think carefully about um, conditional or graded disclosure. And particularly, if you can, to do some rehearsal or practice so before you go back for a return to work interview, you know, go out with a friend or a mate or somebody else and say, just let's run through it. Let's have a practice like a mock interview so I can get the storyline straight. 
So another example is a young man I treated a few years ago. He wanted to find a girlfriend. So he would do it in small steps. So first of all, he might be sitting somewhere and he'd be reading the newspaper. And he would say to her, oh, look at this you know, story in the newspaper about mad killer. Now, if the, the young woman in this case said, oh, you know, you shouldn't believe everything you see in the newspaper. My mother had some depression. You know, most people aren't dangerous at all. Then a bit later, he might say a bit more. But on the other hand, if the young woman said, yeah, they're all crazy. You've got to be careful. You know, every corner there's somebody lurking. First of all, he wouldn't say anymore. And perhaps indeed, that's maybe not the, you know, <laughs> the woman for him. So he then deliberately took a sort of small step at a time, toe in the water, and then it did as a progressive but quite slow gradation of saying more about his own situation. So that's another approach. But I think you've got to sort of work it out yourself. And of course, there are big risks as well as big benefits, um, which might follow saying something to somebody else. Yeah, it, it sounds almost as though, I mean, I don't know if this is is already something that has been implemented, but as a way of tackling stigma, not just kind of trying to inform the public, but in, I suppose, maybe as part of CBT therapy, in training people to navigate that that part of life. Is that something that's already done? or um, And if not, is, is, there, is there anywhere somebody can go to get advice about that? It sounds quite an important thing to learn for people. So, I mean, how do people, um, you know, know how to go about this difficult question about concealment or disclosure? Well, uh, I think talking it through with friends in advance. Um, we've actually developed here at King's College London something called the Decision Aid Tool. There's my colleague, Dr. Claire Henderson, who's been doing this. So we actually have a sort of form you can work through if it might be with a nurse or with a doctor if you're receiving help or treatment. So you can actually decide in advance what you want to say, how much or how little. When you might say it, if you'd volunteer it or only say that if you were sort of directly questioned um, and with what safeguards. So you might say to a boss, as I mentioned, you know, I, I'd like to tell you, but this is in confidence and I don't want everybody in the workplace. Or you might say, and I'm formally applying for reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act. What this means is, you know, you've broken a leg, you go back to work, then you might say, well, I'd like a lift or stairs or an uh, escalator. If somebody's um, had a mental health problem, they might go back and say, well, I want, you know, two weekly supervision, not monthly. I want to be able to travel off peak times because traveling in crowds makes the anxiety worse. Um, I'd like to be able to use you know, headphones because noise, I'm sensitive to noise at the moment. But people might then have particular conditions that they attach as um, how they would find it helpful and supportive in their return to work phase. Right. OK, so we've. Right, we've 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 talked a lot about employment and kind of I suppose we've kind of skipped over some of the um other more kind of obvious factors um that result from stigma. Things like the consequences from say uh, family and friends and um you know, people are gonna lose friends, it's gonna affect relationships. I, f I feel like those are kind of fairly obvious consequences that people are kind of gonna have a, a, a a fairly basic grasp of anyway. Um, but I just wondered if there was anything that you feel is worth kind of adding to that part of the discussion that's maybe not so apparently obvious. Well, um, let's, the thing is that stigma is a type of um, polluting cloud that just gets everywhere. And it interferes with, you know, very many aspects of the lives of people who either have or have had mental health problems. So let's take one example, which is uh, getting access to physical health care. So um, let's take a specific instance of somebody who goes to a casualty. They've got really bad pain in the tummy. And the doctor, first of all, goes up to the computer to see you know, if the person's been in before on any medications or anything, and then says known psychiatric patient. So before they even talk to or examine the person, they've got this sort of um, expectation that this might be a psychiatric or a psychological problem. And they're more likely to then say, you know, it's in your mind or you're anxious or, you know, don't worry me. It's not a real problem. You brackets, you know, you're a malingerer. Now, you might think that that's a bit harsh and that these people in casualties or maybe also in primary care and GP practices are trained not to do that. Um, but the evidence is to the contrary. So there's a lot of evidence now that people who have mental illness and who have a physical illness get second class physical health care. And so let's take one example. 
Uh, this is a study of people in the United States who had a heart attack, so-called myocardial infarction. And there's a big study looking at what happened to people who had a heart attack according to whether they also had a mental illness or not. And in fact, they found big differences because the people who also had, as well as the heart attack and mental illness, then were investigated less and they had less active treatment and the death rates are worse. So I think this is one clue to why we find that the life expectancy of some people with mental illness is actually lower right. than the whole population. So one part of it is that they, they're getting, you know, when they do go for physical problems, um, they're getting worse physical health care. And I'd see that as another aspect of stigmatization, that they're not being treated, you know, that their physical problems are not being treated on their merits as you'd expect for anybody, whether or not they had any other condition. Now, again, this is not a trivial thing because we're seeing uh, severe illnesses going either untreated or less well treated physical illnesses. Um, but also because, especially in middle aged and older people, it's now common in many countries of the world that they have two or three or four long term health conditions altogether. So, for example, it might be high blood pressure and depression, or it could be um, diabetes and depression and rheumatoid arthritis and depression. And increasingly, we're seeing older people have um, a mixture of long term conditions. And either we're seeing people uh, with mental illness having their physical health care needs neglected or we're seeing the opposite, which is people might have rheumatoid arthritis. They go to see their GP or the rheumatologist, but their mental health needs are not being asked about to see if they have, for example, a depression. So that wouldn't be inquired about. It wouldn't be detected. It wouldn't be treated. And in fact, if you have a long term physical problem, you're twice as likely to be depressed as the next person. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So it's that so-called comorbidity. This is conditions occurring at the same time, a physical and a mental. And whichever direction you look, then you're finding people with mental illnesses are being short changed. Wow. It's a bit of a tricky one to, to kind of know how how to tackle that. It sounds almost that there's, there's a very there's a good argument there for why maybe people should seek mental health treatment separate from the GP in the sense of, you know, by you go to the GP and you've already got a pre-existing mental health condition, then, you know, you risk being accused of malingering and, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just anxiety that you just, anxiety causes all sorts of funny symptoms. Um, but yeah, on the flip side of that, a doctor needs to know about the, the mental health issues you face because they have kind of a direct, a, a somatic impact on you as well. What do you think is the, maybe the answer to that? What's the, how do we fix that problem? Well, the, um, the usual answer is to talk about something called integrated care, which means some way of trying to identify for any particular person, the whole range of needs, whether it be physical or mental, and then making sure they get the right treatment. Um, but that's much easier said than done. So, for example, where I work, which is a community mental health team in South London, um, for a long time, we've hoped that people's physical health care needs would be done by the GPs and we'd focus on the mental health care. Um, but for a whole range of reasons, quite often that doesn't happen. So we've now decided that in this mental health clinic, for the patients who come to see us, we also offer physical health care clinics and we check you know, body weight, smoking, blood fats, all that type of thing, because we think that it, it has to be done and that at the moment it's easy for the system to think somebody else will do the right thing for the other part of the picture, the mental or physical, but that may or may not happen. So I think it means different solutions, but as long as we're sure that whatever a person's whole needs are, that somebody, either one place like a clinic or maybe a joined up system, is ensuring that all of the needs are checked, they're identified, and all the treatments are actually being delivered properly. And it's easy to think that somebody else should be doing something else without checking, and in fact they're not, and the consequence is neglect of some part of a person's healthcare needs. Okay, so so, so moving on now, um, I'd like to kind of go back over something you mentioned um, at the beginning of the interview, was this, this concept of why try, I think it's referred to as self-stigma, uh, and if you could kind of just briefly explain 
some of the the, the the problems that arise from that because again that like you say that's that's a problem that's not immediately apparent under this umbrella term of stigma yeah so there are several um parts of the picture here floating around sometimes it's called self-stigma sometimes it's called internalized stigma but let's try and see what's happening so if um i'll give you again start with an example so um when we we're doing a study a couple of years ago here in south london um, about people's experience of discrimination. I then um, sat with a man here at the Morsley Hospital, and one of the questions was, since you've become unwell, have you been discriminated against in applying for a job? He said, nope. So I said, well, you know, since you became unwell a few years ago, have you applied for a job? He said, nope. So I said, well, why not? He said, schizophrenics can't work. And he said it in a very sort of rapid, staccato way. So I said, well, um, you know, can you tell me more about that? He said, everybody knows people like me, schizophrenics, we can never work again. So he had somehow uh, picked up the idea that the diagnosis that he had had permanently rendered him un un unemployable and unable to work. And so he had therefore decided not even to apply. So he'd internalized some picture of the life chances and the future of somebody like him because of one characteristic of all of the many you know talents he had namely the diagnosis that he'd been given so that had a very powerful and negative effect upon him no i disagree with him i don't think any particular diagnosis does or does not in mental health terms mean you can't work now or can't work in the future um, but for him that was a powerful and negative force so I'll give you another example, which is, um, you know, a couple might say to their doctor, let's say one of the couple has a mental illness. You know, we'd like to try for children, but we're not sure because we don't know if the children will be affected. And sometimes doctors will say, you know, you must be very careful. And of course, the children might be affected. And you know, I really couldn't advise that, which would be a misleading statement, because um, where there are genetic aspects uh, as part of the picture of having a mental illness, Often they're very weak effects and the much greater question is whether something in your life is upsetting or a shock or a trauma to you or even that, you know, we actually don't know the causes or the likelihood of somebody, let's say the child, developing a future condition. So but sometimes these um, sometimes quite patronizing, even if they're well intentioned statements from authority figures like doctors can really uh, limit a person's life and leave them um, much less able to participate in the community than they otherwise would. Yeah, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I guess, I, I, I suppose it's, it expands beyond that, though. I suppose in, in just, you know, not just from like a, a, like a career perspective or something, but just this idea that, you know, there's no point in me going try, trying to make friends. I'm not well enough. There's no point in me trying to go out and have any hobbies. There's, you know, I mean, that, that, that idea can completely shut somebody down, which is then obviously just going to cause a downward spiral that's going to exacerbate the problems that exist there anyway. So, um, okay, before we kind of get to wrapping things up, I think one important and quite prominent aspect of mental health stigma at the moment, something that's quite fashionable in the media, is this kind of almost the war against stigmatization for men. That's kind of seen a lot of uh, of stuff about that at the moment i'm just wondering if what, what what are some of the what are some of the specific challenges faced by men with mental health issues when it comes to stigma yeah so let's look again to start with a specific example of um this is a man who was the captain of the new zealand rugby team and who um towards the end of his active playing career himself had quite a severe episode of anxiety and depression and he then, um, after his treatment and he was feeling better, uh, came out and made quite a few statements and films about what had happened, saying that in not just in the rugby world, but in the male world, there's a sort of macho culture where, you know, a real man is strong and tough and doesn't really talk about feelings and certainly doesn't show weakness. And in particular, that in the sports and in the athletes world, um, you have to be sort of top fit peakness and you're competing and, you know, any sign of weakness and you're dead and you, you're not competitive. So he was saying this is actually a nonsense because these things happen to everybody. And interestingly, in the sports world now, 
there's an attempt to switch that around. In fact, a lot of cricketers and some footballers as well have been coming out about the experiences. And also in recent months, uh, several boxers and athletes. And you don't simply say, you know, you mustn't admit weakness. Uh, You can actually switch and say um, a person, but also a team can only really perform at peak fitness or compete at top competitiveness if they're fully fit in mind and body. And if there's any difficulty they're having, either you know a physical injury or a mental difficulty, then they're not going to be performing at their top level. So you have to pay attention to the whole person emotionally, socially, mentally and physically to allow that person to do their very best. So and that's you see quite a lot of psychologists now working with, for example, football teams and also with tennis players and so on to try and get that fine tuning. So I think we're seeing a greater recognition about how even among you know male culture, um, it's not just important, but it's actually also good for their performance as well. Do we know if these um, these these recent mental health campaigns specifically aimed at men? Do we know yet if they're actually having any kind of impact? So the the, the race the most recent. Uh, focus and the time to change. We haven't um, evaluated that per se. But what we have done in previous waves is to look at where the campaign was focused on specific target groups. So, for example, um, in one of the years, uh, Frank Bruno was one of the champions. We know that in that year, there's a greater response in stigma reduction among black people who were surveyed. And also we know that in the subsequent phase of time to change, this is the national anti-stigma program in England, there's a particular focus on young people, again, where they responded to material, films and so on, particularly targeted towards that um, segment of the population. So I don't know specifically for men, but we know from previous experience, it's likely that if you do target specific uh, information, it's likely to succeed. So uh, Time to Change in the last year or two has done quite a few films. Uh, one is of two men talking and they're having a cup of tea. They're sitting in the kitchen. And one saying that one had helped the other and the second is saying he'd received help and, you know, it mattered to him. And it's only right at the end of the film, which is a short film, that the man who had received help uh, mentioned that he had been suicidal. And he'd been on the point of taking a, a very big overdose when he's had a chat with a friend which had actually probably stopped his death. And so you get the real um, impact uh, of that nature of the disclosure and of the importance of talking, which can save lives. Yeah, I think um, just from uh, personal experience, I have to say um, I, I've been quite impressed with with, with, with some of the with, with some of the campaigns. Particularly, there was one with um, I think I think it's called Jamal Edwards, the, the, the guy behind SBTV, which is like a popular YouTube hip hop channel. So he was going around talking to uh, UK grime and hip hop artists about about mental health, and I really like that campaign because I think particularly that kind of culture. If you know, if you, you've got rap MCs are saying it's okay to talk about this stuff, then I really do think that's going to be going to have an impact, particularly on young people. It's like, well, if, you know, if, if those guys are talking about it, then maybe it's, it, it's okay to talk about. The one thing I, I do think is, is missing from this particular, this, this, these campaigns aimed at men is, um, so from personal experience, it, it, it doesn't matter to me whether, um, any, anybody could come on. So say someone like Jay Z. To me, Jay Z is like God. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Jay Z, and he could he could come on TV and he could say, you know, that he had mental health issues. Uh, I mean, he could come and visit me in person, and he could tell me that he had mental health issues, and you know that it's it's kind of okay to talk about it. But for me, my personally, my my issues were. Um, around anxiety and even saying that now to you it it makes me cringe every time this idea of 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 being anxious and this idea of being it's like it's okay to talk about it and that society's stereotypical views of masculinity kind of don't don't apply none of that really appeals to me and I think there's a certain subset of guys like that who are like me that the message, we don't want to hear the message that we kind of need to change our views of what masculinity is. You know, masculinity can be completely subjective. You know, it can mean one thing to one guy and, and, and that's fine. But to me, it means a, a very specific thing, even if that does mean that it kind of conforms to the stereotypical viewpoint of, of masculinity and telling me that, that I need to kind of get rid of that. That's not going to work for me. I feel that you know, I want to know that I can go to a therapist and repair that. I can, I can take that sense of masculinity 
into the therapist with me and and work on that and that's going to be okay and and i think another thing is what what appeals to me more than this idea of kind of sitting down and talking to somebody is having a therapist that is going to be somebody that's going to give me tools to kind of get over this someone that's going to kind of um help me through it i don't necessarily want to sit down and and, and talk about it in that sense but just someone that's going to help me be proactive and get through this if if that makes sense i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that but i just i just feel that that's kind of a there's a, there's a subset of of men probably like myself that are, are being maybe missed with those campaigns so i think these are all really important points danny so you know no two people are the same and when you know for example the time to change campaign says it's time to talk that doesn't mean everyone's to be talking all the time and everybody's disclosing everything and it's all in public so for some people um they're quite comfortable to make you know public statements uh, many people probably most people are not um but on the other hand there may be other ways to talk um without talking to many people or without even taking any risks in terms of disclosure or you know loss of reputation or status mm. one way is to do it for example in terms of you know confidential relationships with a, a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or nurse whatever but where you can speak openly but have a strong degree of trust that you know other people are not going to find out about that yeah another way is to do it you know through aliases online so there are a lot of forums where people do share information get enormous amounts of you know, validation support but their identities are concealed because they choose to use another name or you know a handle or something but nevertheless they're getting um direct contact of people quite often who have other similar experiences that may be ongoing it may be in periods of crisis and so there's an, and within that again anonymized framework people might be very open about exactly what's happening indeed in times of crisis they might actually get enormous support from complete strangers who they feel they know very well but they don't know their names so there are degrees of protection you can build in and maintain you know your outside world sense of being a man that's functioning and so on but have moments of reflection or sharing which actually are much more um um uh, sort of healing or nourishing in other ways yeah um okay one final question i think's worth asking is does say say these these anti stigma campaigns are successful as a whole is there a chance of kind of unforeseen problems cropping up precisely because they've been successful because what what i mean by this is we, we, you hear a lot about mental health services are, are underfunded and understaffed as it is and obviously if if these anti stigma campaigns are successful and that encourages more people to go and seek help the possibility it seems that there's a possibility there that the the services are going to be even more stretched and then even less effective than maybe they already are and i'm wondering whether are we putting the cart before the horse in 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 focusing maybe on 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 anti stigma being such a a huge thing in the media at the moment whereas maybe it would be better to focus on um kind of funding government funding efforts first i just wonder what your your thoughts are on that yeah it's a bit of cart and horse about you know or chicken and egg here so one way to think about this is thinking about you know of all the people who have mental health problems um how many actually get any help at all and you could talk about things that are stimulating demand people going to the gps going to psychological treatment centers you know saying i'm not well i need help or you think about supply meaning actually are there enough therapists and doctors and nurses and so on ready to uh, receive and offer treatment to the numbers needing it and it's always an uneasy for friction um there's no point stimulating you know through an anti stigma campaign huge numbers of people to go off to mental health services or even primary care services if there just aren't the numbers of services available and they'll be frustrated or turned away um on the other hand there's no point you know investing in at the moment for example large numbers of new psychology posts if people won't go there because they fear stigma so you've got to try and do both at the same time and the balance will never be quite right there will be some friction but generally i think you know in many cases in the british health service um demand drives supply and when you've seen conditions which have become less stigmatized for example hiv then services sooner or later have done the right thing and responded 
um, to better meet the needs of coming forward. So it's, it's not the question of stimulating you know, supply or demand, but doing both at the same time. But the starting point is that so few people in this country, it's only a quarter of people who do have a mental illness are getting any treatment. So there's a long way to go you know, before we're actually fully supplying mental health services in relation to the level of need. Right, Graham, are you super pressed for time? Or because I'd like, I've just got my, the philosophical questions, the kind of quick fire questions, but I, w- I want to be respectful of your time, of course. That's okay. I've got two minutes till uh, four o'clock, Danny. So whatever we can do in two minutes. Okay. Right. So I'll, I think my, my three most important questions that I, I run past everybody. So the first one is what's the best piece of life advice that anyone's ever given you? So. I think I'd say that um, this was not, you know, advice told to me, but it was the example. And this is my grandmother. And she uh, lived to the ripe old age of 101. And every time I met her, really the only thing she would do would be to encourage me. And she never had a critical word. Now, she wasn't my parent, so it was easier, but... Um, that was a very important relationship to me because she listened and she gave me positive feedback and she encouraged me every time we met. And so that was a very important uh, part of my growing up. Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfillment? So I, um, outside of you know, work and family, uh, I think that the uh, one of the things that I do which is important is to try hard to keep physically fit. And I think everything else you know, that I do benefits from um, having more energy or feeling more positive you know, in myself. And that you know, when I, for different reasons, do less exercise, uh, then I feel worse. Okay, and finally, the big one. What do you think is the key to happiness? No comment, Danny. No comment. Well, I've not had that one before, so an original answer is always a good answer. Graeme Thornacroft, thank you very much for your time. Is there any links um, on the web you'd like to recommend the listeners pay a visit to? Yes, so I think a good starting point is to search for time to change. And there's lots and lots of materials there and which are really, really good about uh, how to reduce, and we hope before long, eradicate stigma. Okay, perfect. Graeme, thank you very much. Okay, all the best, Danny. Okay, if you'd like to comment on this episode, you can do so by going to myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. That's also where you'll find all the show notes and links to any relevant information. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by leaving us a positive review on iTunes or just sharing your favourite episode with your friends and family on social media. If you'd like to contact me, I'm Danny D. Whittaker on Facebook and Twitter, or you can send me an email to danny at myownworstenemy.org. And until next time, behave yourselves, but not too much, and I'll see you again next time.